I do enough waiting in real life. The last thing I want to do when I sit down to play a video game is add another in-game commute, sit through unskippable cutscenes, or slave away in the gaming mines for all of eternity. Moving from one place to another should be just as enjoyable as the rest of the game, but with the push to create larger and larger game worlds, video game characters can't always keep up. A lot of times I find myself waiting. When things aren't engaging and take a long time, that's when I lose interest. That's not to say big world equal bad. Instead, I want to share ways that alleviate the chore of navigating such big environments, and even explain the benefits of having a big open world. There certainly can be value in an in-game commute. Open world games are doing their best to make this long stretch of downtime more meaningful. These may be the only moments in the story where characters get a chance to breathe. Adding conversations that take place between important destinations can expand a story, comment on the world around them, or show a different side of the characters involved. That time can also be spent indulging in other forms of entertainment. Los Santos is one of Rockstar's biggest open worlds, meaning that the real-time driving from one mission to another will start to add up. Thankfully, you don't have to follow the rules of the road. Fast and fun, albeit unhinged driving, is encouraged. The act of speeding through intersections while jamming the hundreds of real-world music artists, hoping that you... Just hoping that you... Just hoping that you make it to the other side is really fun. Random events like encountering dragons in Skyrim can shake up an otherwise boring trek through an open field. But despite all the ways designers try to make this time more meaningful, your actions themselves don't change. Instead, they repeat while you chase down a waypoint marker, while waiting for your stamina to refill every few seconds. With little to no obstacles in your way, the only variable is how much time it takes to move from one location to another. If your basic movement is too slow, players will find any way they can to optimize it. The next thing you know, Link is sidestepping through Hyrule Field, or practicing his whistling to magically regain stamina. Why do you think gliders are so popular post Breath of the Wild? They're efficient, fun, and reward you for reaching high places. If you give players something to do that lets them navigate the world more efficiently, you get something like the Pathless. The world in the Pathless is covered with talisman that the hunter can shoot for a huge burst of speed, so you're constantly within bow range of an engaging activity that helps with both exploration and movement. Fast travel has always felt like a bandage solution for some time now, but it doesn't have to be. Some games implement it really well. By adding a little context, you don't need to break immersion as you travel from one side of the map to the other. Controlling Spider-Man is already more fun than controlling the average person. But even when Spider-Man needs to move somewhere in a hurry, the New York City subway is always there. When you fast travel, you'll get short scenes of Spider-Man riding the subway, passing time amongst the citizens of New York City. This still doesn't fix the fade to black, nor the subway dropping Spider-Man off at the top of the nearest skyscraper. If physically entering subway stations scattered around Manhattan open fast travel, it would add just one more degree of immersion that it didn't have before. Hollow Knight's world of Hollow Nest is enormous, so they implemented a fast travel function of their own. As you explore, you'll find stag stations, an interconnected underground railway not too different from Spider-Man's subways. However, in Hollow Knight, you need to find and pay to open each stag station. You can only start fast travel by already being at one of the station entrances. Hollow Nest is supposed to be dangerous. Having to walk to the stations mean you can't instantly travel to safety at any time. Finding a new station becomes a huge relief, giving you a new shortcut, along with a bench to rest, save, and recover HP. Convenient level design leads you down a path with a loop in mind. If by exploring and overcoming a challenge, you find a shortcut leading back to a previous area, or a new path toward your next goal, you won't find yourself needlessly traveling the same ground, even after death. MMOs seem to have forgotten about that loop, or even the journey for that matter. By signing the terms and conditions of a character's quest, you're expected to walk to another place just to continue the conversation, then walk all the way back to turn in that quest. You better get used to staring at the backside of your mount, because that's all you'll be seeing during the many quests required for progression. The constant back and forth when accepting and turning in quests adds no substance outside of slowly moving from one set of coordinates on the map to another. So why can't we make the journey as important as the destination? Well, a lot of genres and a lot of games do it in their own way. Getting to the destination can be the challenge, whether that's racking up a high score, solving a challenging puzzle, 
or having the platforming skill to even get there. A lot of games have different modes of transportation. Games find unique ways for players to move around their environments all the time. But they don't just have to be the means of getting from one place to another. Crazy Taxi scores your ability to drive fast. It's got crazy physics and crazier level design, letting you ignore the road and make your own path. The other cars on the road are made of cardboard, so if you make any mistakes, well, at least you know it's not your life that's on the line. Driving patrons to their destination as fast as possible and getting bonuses for close calls and airtime makes the act of driving fun. Games like Rollerdrome and Tony Hawk drop you in the smaller size levels you need to complete a list of challenges in, from finding items to getting a high score performing tricks and combos. The tight responsive controls make these games. Performing tricks in succession and not getting hit requires you master the controls and become intimately familiar with each level. Whether you get satisfaction from seeing your high scores climb, or just feeling like a pro gliding through these spaces you once had trouble with, you're rewarded for your repetition, practice, and putting in the work. Some games have taken this kind of movement and dropped it into a complete open world experience. Sunset Overdrive is essentially a big game of the floor is lava. Moving on the ground is intentionally slow and dangerous. You're encouraged to climb, bounce, and grind on literally everything. No matter where you look, the world is covered in things to grind on and objects to bounce off a cartoonishly high distance to keep your momentum going. This open world is more like an oversized playground for you to explore every inch of, looking for collectibles that you actually want to collect. Some games have these truly one-of-a-kind ideas. In Gravity Rush, Cat has a feline partner that gives her the power to manipulate gravity. Cat's not flying, rather falling with style. The camera conveys which direction Cat will fall towards, as she has all kinds of unique animations to show her letting her body relax as gravity does all the work. Her gravity slide twists gravity against the floor and angles the camera slightly so she can slide downhill no matter the angle. Hexville is situated high in the sky, giving Cat the freedom to explore it from every angle. Cat can walk up and down the sides of towering skyscrapers and use her power to complete time trials and in combat. Sliding and diving into enemies deals the most damage, using kinetic energy to deliver devastating blows. Sometimes all you need to do is change how many legs your protagonist has. In Stray, you control a biblically accurate house cat. Navigating a world built for humans as a cat makes you rethink how you see and interact with the world. Locked doors, open windows, and iron bars look a lot different when you can slip right through them. Platforming in Stray is as simple as pressing a button within jumping distance. The simplicity translates to feeling like an agile cat, using small objects in the environment to get around. Interesting ways to move are what platformers are all about. Getting Mario to the top of Bomb Bomb Battlefield is the name of the game. If you see something interesting in the distance, you can use all kinds of unique ways to move to get there. The best platformers have abilities incorporated into their design. Mario has changed a lot over the years. His 2D outings gave him items like the Tanuki Leaf and Cape, letting him take to the skies after gaining enough speed. Sunshine gave us Flood, a water-powered jetpack that let Mario hover in the air. This made platforming easier, but also opened up possibilities to help Mario reach places in ways he wasn't able to before. Cappy and Mario Odyssey's more important ability let Mario take control of enemies, but at the same time gave Mario more actions for platforming. By chaining together throwing Cappy in the air, diving into him to bounce up, and then throwing and diving again, let Mario reach distances not possible before. The bird and bear duo, Banjo and Kazooie, make for an interesting pair. If there's something Banjo can't do alone, Kazooie can assist right from his backpack. Their platforming abilities come from their animal characteristics. Banjo's claws and Kazooie's destructive eggs help them in combat, while Kazooie's long legs and wings help Banjo up steep mountains and get more height in the air. In addition to her already large number of jumping abilities, Demon Turf's lead Beebs uses her demon powers to give context to her double jump, glide, and swim by transforming into different creatures best suited for each action. Platformers with a wide variety of movement options let multiple people interact with the same environment in different ways. The best kind of level design doesn't always make these advanced movements required, nor does it create one strict sequence of actions to get to the end. The best kind of level design gives players the freedom to experiment and create their own path forward, while encouraging more difficult execution to more efficiently navigate that same space. Other games make how you interact with your environment just as important as the moves you have to navigate them with. 
Sonic is a great example. Building speed by hitting a ramp at just the right angle, or spinning downhill lets you give the middle finger to any of the times you need to go uphill. Maintaining that speed by mastering your movement and your environment is the reward. You can see how the formula was improved with each additional ability added to Sonic's kit. The addition of a spin dash let Sonic gain speed from a standstill. It quickly got you moving again if you reached a ramp you didn't initially have the speed to clear. The drop dash gave Sonic a quick burst of speed when hitting the ground after a jump, keeping momentum gained after a jump. You can see the evolution each additional action adds to deepen movement. Even the 3D games like Adventure and Adventure 2 use momentum to reach shortcuts and skip sections of levels. How efficiently you move through each level can be a form of player expression. You're rewarded with a letter grade after completing each stage. Barely made it. By making doing things fast the goal, it opens up game design all sorts of unique ways. Neon White times and ranks your performance in each level, unlocking an online leaderboard after gaining enough insight. Unsighted uses its narrative about a finite resource that keeps yourself and your friends alive as motivation to be fast and efficient. These games ease you into the idea of speedrunning and encourage replays to get better. If you make your world too big in an RPG, then you're in big trouble since movement isn't typically the focus. Final Fantasy XII needs a times 2 and times 4 speed multiplier to make it anywhere before the release of the actual final Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy XII's quickening attacks are these long cutscenes that repeat as you chain them together. All you have to do is select the next quickening before the timer runs out, making this really simple process where the majority of it is just watching repeated animations that look cool, but start to overstay their welcome after the hundredth time, making them not so quick. Aning. A world map can do wonders presenting the scale of a huge world while keeping the convenience and detail of exploring only the areas key to the story. Many of the games in the Shin Megami Tensei series take place in some sort of alternate version of Tokyo, Japan. SMT4 and 4 Apocalypse do a phenomenal job creating a big, yet compact and complex world for you to explore, keeping all points of interest relatively close while including shortcuts that give you easy access to previous areas. Even if your game is an RPG, you can still introduce fun types of movement. Going from walking up to enemies in Persona 3 and 4 to start combat, to Persona 5's approach of hiding in the shadows to ambush enemies makes a huge difference. Not only is it thematically appropriate for the Phantom Thieves to stay undetected, but it's also more consistent. Gone are the awkward interactions where enemies move in unpredictable ways, or where you just barely miss an opening attack. Now it's clearly defined where you can hide from enemy sight, and when you can successfully go in for an ambush. This type of consistency makes all the difference in a game where attack order makes all the difference. Even restricting movement can enhance a gaming experience, especially in survival horror. Tank controls are a controversial control scheme. Instead of having free movement, you need to turn your body in the direction you want to move before walking forward. I've always been a defender of limited movement in horror games. The harder it is to navigate these cramped spaces, the more dangerous your enemies become. The extra time it takes to perform even the simplest of actions simulates the anxiety and unclear thinking you might face if you were actually in that space. Resident Evil 7 and 8 even have a guard button. It's designed with your slow movement in mind. You won't be able to move out of the way of an attack in every situation, but you're still given the tools to react and to mitigate incoming damage. Looking down the camera lens in Fatal Frame plants your feet to the floor, forcing you to commit to this tense standoff. You're staring these aggressive ghosts down directly in the face. This force limitation puts you in really difficult situations where you need to engage with your limited inventory of health and weapons in order to get out alive. It increases the feeling of helplessness since many of the options you might have relied on aren't as reliable as you first thought. Games can feel slow for a number of reasons. Tying longer repeated animations to simple actions can bring down my enjoyment. It means I'm spending less time making choices and more time waiting. In the battle for video game realism, games like Red Dead Redemption 2 has you spend roughly 20 real-time seconds meticulously collecting an animal's pelt. These are tasks that you do multiple times with animations that add up versus just pressing a single button to have a thing show up in your inventory. I'll take this, or this, or this, or this any day over this. You'd be doing less work as an animator for more streamlined gameplay. 
Sometimes it's not just the animations that are slow. Sometimes it's doing a lot of work for a simple outcome. Navigating the water temple in Ocarina of Time is divisive because of how much is involved in just changing the water level. Link floats unless the iron boots are equipped. When they're equipped, he sinks slowly to the bottom. And every time you need to change boots, you need to pause the game, navigate to equipment, and swap boots. The constant pausing and unpausing, how slow Link moves in the water, and the compounding time it takes to navigate the dungeon sucks any fun right out of it. Hacking was a major part of Bioshock. Hacking different machines resulted in different benefits to the player, but the work involved quickly outweighed its benefits. Hacking paused the real-time gameplay and replaced it with a minigame about rearranging tubes. Every single time you wanted to hack something, you needed to remove yourself from the action, reveal, and reorganize tubes. All of that time made me want to give up on hacking altogether. Bioshock 2 thankfully made the process much better. Hacking doesn't pause the game and any real-time threats remain. Instead of a long minigame, a bar pops up with a sliding dial that you need to time in the correct spot. This new method is immediate and responsive. The second you begin hacking is the same moment the bar appears, and the moment of your input is the same moment you either successfully hack or fail and need to try again. Any action that's been streamlined to take less time never goes unnoticed or unappreciated. Even something as simple as a slow ladder climb in any other game is a pulley system in the pathless that quickly pulls you up to the top of any lookout tower. Wolf's Olympic athlete tier swimming in Sekiro makes getting around in the water a breeze. Sometimes the reward for your hard work is the means to save time. Taking the time to tame a horse in Breath of the Wild lets you call on them from most places on the map. Clearing the Champion's Ballad DLC gives you the Master Cycle Zero, making it the fastest way to travel Hyrule and the most stylish. Removing the number of times an action needs to be repeated can be a reward in itself. Maintaining a farm in Stardew Valley is a lot of hard work, but the more you play, the better equipment you get. Where at the start, one swing of your trusty hoe was covering one space at a time, your now trustier Iridium hoe now covers a whopping 18 spaces. Other actions like watering plants can even be automated with sprinklers, removing the need to individually water crops. No Genre illustrates this sense of automation better than logistics games like Factorio and Satisfactory. In Factorio, you need to gather resources in order to build a rocket to escape a hostile alien planet. What starts as a process of mundane gathering of materials by hand quickly evolves into a self-sufficient and more importantly automated process. By building an interconnected ecosystem of machinery, you can gather and process more materials than you would ever be able to with your own two hands. Progression in Factorio removes the need to repeat boring, laborious actions and replaces it with a web of decision making in how to plan to optimize and scale up your exponentially growing operation. It doesn't matter how big your world is, what matters is that it's fun to move around in. There's nothing worse for me when a game doesn't respect my time with slow movement or long animations. Despite that, there's still games that use time and an empty world to artistically bring a world to life. Games like Death Stranding and Shadow of the Colossus come to mind that's empty worlds strengthen their themes. But it's just as important to make the journey as exciting as the destination. Though some people's idea of slow might be different from mine, I just wanted to highlight how games make this time, moving from A to B, more exciting. Thanks for watching to the end. Consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this and subscribe to the second channel for live stream uploads. I live stream on Twitch and I also have a Discord. If you really like my content, please consider sending a tip on Ko-fi. All tips go back into my content by purchasing games for future videos or live streams. Links to all of these platforms can be found in the description below.